Welcome to lecture two related to public libraries in the UK. In this second lecture, we're going to focus on some of the themes related to public libraries being a service for all. Public libraries are obviously charged with serving the entire community. And this is a worthy mission, but it's also one that brings challenges and it needs a deep understanding of the range of services libraries provide and also the range of needs that a community might have. So in terms of the overview of the first part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the broad notion of equity and freedom of access as a core mission of public libraries. We're going to talk about the professional challenges faced by the librarian in providing equity of access. And we'll also highlight some services aimed at specific user communities to facilitate equity of access. Now Carnegie's vision was a bold one. There's not such a cradle of democracy upon the earth as a free public library. This republic of letters where neither rank, office nor wealth receives its lightest consideration. So again, mirroring themes from lecture one, it's really important to remember that the public library should be seen as a social equaliser. It should be seen by those who work there, those who fund it, and also the wider community as somewhere where anyone is welcome, regardless of who you are in society. And this is a fundamentally important principle that we really always ought to have at the top of our minds. Now, it does bring challenges. Can a universal service really be possible? In a professional world of scarce resources, can the truly universal service be achieved? If it can't, how do we decide on priorities? Now, there's an argument for saying that the mission is all well and good, but it's not really possible to achieve it. Well, that is I suppose a tad defeatist, but it's also something we have to be cognizant of because resources are finite. We have to spend resources in ways that target need as much as possible. And we'll talk about some of those issues today. Just for a moment, let's take a step back and look at the legal context of equality. The Equality Act 2010 harmonized and replaced previous legislation related to equality in the UK. For example, the Racial Relations Act 1976 and the Disability Discrimination Act 1995. The Equality Act defines protected characteristics, but it also extended and strengthened aspects of the previous laws I just cited. Now the protected characteristics are age, disability, gender reassignment, race, religion or belief, sex, sexual orientation, marriage and civil partnership, and pregnancy and maternity. Now, in terms of the application of the law, what does it mean? What are the key aspects? Now, it means that we must be mindful of both direct and indirect discrimination when dealing with users. Direct discrimination is treating someone less favorably for example, because of their race, religion, sex or sexual orientation. But we must also be mindful of indirect discrimination. And indirect discrimination is imposing requirements that put certain groups at an unfair disadvantage compared with others. And both are very, very important to understand from a public service provision point of view. Now you might say, well, public libraries don't discriminate and of course they shouldn't discriminate. But I'm going to cite a couple of historic examples that will give you an idea of where public libraries can stray into discrimination. So some recent challenges. Between 1988 and 2003, or 2000 in Scotland, public libraries were subject to a law that impacted on their ability to serve the whole community. The infamous Section 28 of the Local Government Act 1988 stated that a local authority shall not intentionally promote homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality. Now, that may seem like an arcane notion, but 2003 is not that long ago in terms of service provision. There'll be many of you listening to this who perhaps worked in public libraries or in local government during that period, so you will probably remember that piece of legislation. Now, what is the end result of legislation like that? Well, a section of the community is disenfranchised. But also importantly, from the point of view of library service provision, 
self-censorship becomes something that the library profession and library workers have to worry about. You know, by self-censorship, what I mean is, let's just say you're looking to choose stock for your library. You're mindful of legislation such as the Local Government Act that specifies you can't buy this kind of material or be seen to buy it. So you, in advance, don't buy it. It's not even a case of you having it on your shelf. You don't buy it by virtue of the fact that you think you're not allowed to buy it. Now, self-censorship generally is an important issue that sometimes it falls under the radar professionally. We don't talk about it. And, you know, it's really a case of trying to preempt any potential challenges to material that you might find. But ultimately, when we do that, we fail to serve a section of the community. So Section 28 was an example of public services more broadly, not just libraries failing to serve a mem a, an entire section of the community and disenfranchise them at the same time. And that, that kind of situation should not really occur. But again, in recent history, it has. Now, other pressures to self-censor occur as well from a political standpoint. This is a little bit further back, but it's certainly in my professional memory. I was working in libraries at the time when it happened. In 1986, a bitter industrial dispute occurred between News International and the print trade unions. Now what this led to was 20 to 30 public library authorities, including major cities such as Glasgow, Edinburgh and Sheffield, refusing to display copies of any newspapers published by News International. And this was because those cities were administered by Labour councils who were trying to support the trade unions and trying to ensure that News International weren't giving prominence. Now, these kind of situations, these kind of politically motivated situations, raise questions for public libraries. The question I've asked at the bottom of that slide is, is that acceptable for a public library? Well, you know, you've got the ethical standpoint and the legal standpoint, but legally the answer was no. In the Crown versus London Borough of Ealing and others ex-party Times newspapers, it was deemed to be an unlawful abuse of the 1964 Act. So the pressure to censor or limit access to materials will always occur. And it can be from the point of view of the people administering the, the library service. It could be from members of the community who are writing to you to say they don't like a particular book or other type of resource. And all of these are examples of other interested parties trying to censor the materials you have. So, you know, don't underestimate how that pressure to censor will be something that actually impacts on your professional life, because it will. And you really do need to be able to re respond to that robustly. In America, for instance, the ALA Band Book Week, which happens every September, is an excellent example of promoting the extent of challenges to books and libraries. And what they do every year is they publish a list of the most challenged books in libraries to highlight exactly the types of material that are being challenged and why. And again, from a professional development point of view, Keep an eye out for the ALA Band Book Week because it's extremely informative and the advocacy it provides can give you great ammunition for defending any challenges to books that you deem to be inappropriate. As well as the American Library Association Band Book Week, other resources are provided by organisations like IFLA. Now, IFLA's Committee on Free Access to Information and Freedom of Expression, abbreviated as FAITH, have a website offering advice and resources related to intellectual freedom in libraries and it also includes policy documents. One good way of responding to challenges to books and other materials in libraries, for instance, is to have a very good stock development policy, which states the criteria for what you uh, provide to the public and why. So again, if you receive a challenge to a book or other item, you can point to your stock development policy and say, these are the parameters of what we buy, when we buy it and why. And that can be a very good advocacy tool because you can make it public, you can make it available on your library website and people can understand why you do what you do. So censorship is something that you should always be mindful of. But in dealing with the public, other issues come into consideration as well. A major study undertaken by Sheffield University and Dr. Bryony Birdie and Kerry Wilson related to public libraries and empathy. Now, this was a research project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And what they were doing was investigating public library staff attitudes in England towards social inclusion policies and towards disadvantaged communities more broadly. 
Now, the study revealed a lack of clarity and understanding within public library services of what social exclusion means and its relationship with other social policy objectives, particularly within the access and equality agendas. And again, these are issues that public library staff should be aware of. Public libraries are services that basically anyone can use, as I stated earlier. So the notion of social inclusion and social exclusion should be important concepts all staff understand. So concluding this first section before I move on to specific services. The librarian should reach out to the local communities, forging links and developing sustainable partnerships. In promoting a culture of inclusion and at the same time celebrating the individuality of the library user, the librarian will maximise opportunities for all people. All library staff must be proud of the contribution they make to the inclusive society and should learn to articulate this contribution to all. This second half of the lecture focuses on one of the core missions of public libraries, namely the promotion of reading and reader development within a community. So in terms of the subjects we're going to discuss, we're going to highlight the ongoing debate regarding the lending of fiction and the notion of whether libraries provide culture or leisure or both. We'll talk about the great fiction question, public lending and write, reader development, reading initiatives, and we'll also cover young people's services. So if you recall from lecture one, one of the ongoing debates was related to public libraries providing a way of basically swaying people from what was seen to be bad leisure pursuits to good leisure pursuits. As he is in Morris State, a strong argument for the establishment of public libraries related to the reform of leisure, recognising them as a means of providing better recreational opportunities for working class people. Now it would be childish of us to not recognise that this debate about public libraries, about the provision of worthy materials versus non-worthy materials, has been an ongoing one since the exception. I referenced this in Lecture 1 for instance. But it's also important to understand how those debates are encapsulated. So philosophically speaking, a utilitarian argument would state that prejudice apart, the game of pushpin, is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. And that was a, an oft-quoted line from Jeremy Bentham, uh, a leading proponent of utilitarianism. And in that argument, what he's saying is that, you know, what people enjoy is really their business. If it has value to them from the point of view of leisure, then that's what matters. So it's no one's business to impose their view of what culture is on someone else. Equally, uh, John Stuart Mill, who was another utilitarian philosopher, disagreed. He said, of two pleasures, if there be one which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is a more desirable pleasure. So he's not necessarily advocating that high art is better than low art, in that quote. What he's saying is, people can generally agree what is good and what is bad, and really that's what should matter. 